We're here on the banks of Ganfrood Fishery, which is a four and a half acre mature lake in southwest Wales near Carmarthen. I've cast out, so let's see if there's luck with us today. Here we go, first fish of the day. He has got some cracking rainbows and brownies in here. Ooh, he's fighting well. Keep a bend in that rod. And it looks like a rainbow. Right. Ooh, he's not quite ready for the net yet. He's boring down into the weeds. He's trying to shake that hook off. What he's trying to do is rub his mouth ahead of the weeds. No, we've got him up a little bit higher in the water. He's diving again down into the weeds. Come on, come on. You're gonna go back, don't worry. Oh no, no, this one's full of life. And as I said, he has got some uh, hard fighting fish in this lake. I think this one's been fed on steroids. Again, he's off. Come on, back you come. He's now trying to tangle me up in the platform, but keep him out of there. Come on, round you come. Round you come. All right, let's get this one into the net. Cracking rainbow of about two and a half pound. Let's have a look at him. First of all, keep him in the water before you're going to pick a fish up. Then make sure you wet your hands and you can get control of the fish. Take the hook out. There you go, a beautiful, fully finned rainbow. First fish of the day, what a way to start. After landing that wonderful fish, let's look at the tackle. First of all, to start fly fishing, you're gonna need a rod. And there are thousands out there on the market. So what are you gonna have to look for? First of all, there are three types of action. The first one, I'll explain, put the rod down there, is a tip action rod. That means it's about this part, about that much of the tip that actually works. Down here, it's very, very powerful, and they are designed to cast very, very tight loops and cast immense distances. Really designed for large reservoirs, but be careful, these are for more experienced anglers. Then we have one which we call a through action, and as it explains, goes all the way from the tip up here, all the way down, right into the handle. Now those are designed for fishing loch style, basically fishing from a boat, casting maybe 10, 15 yards, dibbling the fly back through the surface. But again, that is a specific job. So what you're looking for to start with is a rod with an action which has middle to tip, or tip to middle if you want, and it works again from the tip about halfway down the rod. And what that will do, don't think about the action stops halfway down the rod. If it's windy, you have more reserve power down here and you can cast still a long way. Now we look at the length of the rod. When you're starting, something between nine and nine and a half foot is ideal. However, if you're a youngster, when I started, it was a six foot glass fiber rod. Now I'm showing my age because that was many, many years ago. My daughter started at five and she started with a seven foot rod. So if you're a youngster, get the rod shorter. Onto the rod, we have to put a reel. Now years and years ago, if you can look at the inner part of this reel, that nut there, that's where the inner drum of the reel used to be. And what used to happen was, we used to fill it up with string, then put the backing on, and then put the line on. What we wanted to do is store the line as wide a coil as possible. The problem with those, when it got wet, if you put the reel in the water, or if it started raining, that string would absorb the water, the backing would absorb the water, and it would get very, very heavy. Nowadays, we've got what we call large arbor. And as you can see, the inner drum there is very, very wide. So that is just space. You don't have to fill it up. So the backing goes on that inner drum, and then the line goes at the end of the backing when all the line is stored in that wide drum. And if you think about it, if you're not fishing for three, four, five days, or even longer, the line is still stored in wide coils. If we were using the old type of reels with the inner drum that wide, the problem was when you pulled that line off the reel, it would be in small, small coils and be very, very difficult to cast. Next, we've got the line. Now, there are two types of profiles of lines. One is a double taper. What that means, if I pull this line off, 
The double taper will be the same diameter. Put the rod down there. If you look at the thickness of this line, the full 30 yards of that line will be that thick. However, just at the front end, and I'll put them together, you can see the thick belly here, and at the front end of the line, just hold them there, so if you can see, you see the thick part on top, and then it tapers down gradually to the front end. And the double taper, as the Americans call it, it's a reversible line. So once the, this front end, it may be frayed, you can turn the line around and actually fish with the other side. However, the modern lines and the ones that I advise you start with is a weight forward. Now we peel this line off and what you'll see, all this white part is the weight of the line. Then it tapers down where the weight ends it's this orange part. That is your back taper. This should be near the tip of the rod when you're casting. And then the rest of the line is called the shooting line or the running line. And as you can see, that white belly on top is very, very thick. And the thin running line, the gray one, is very, very thin. Now, to match the line up to the rod, if you look at any rod, they'll either have the letters AFTM, which stands for American Fishing Tackle Manufacturers, or it'll have a hash sign or, as this one, it just says line. And after that, there'll be some numbers. Now, what that number corresponds to is the actual weight of the line. What they did many, many years ago, they built this scale, the AFTM scale. And what happens, they take the first 10 yards, 30 feet or 9.2 meters in the new money, and they measure it. Whatever that weighs, that corresponds on the AFTM scale, and it matches the rod. With this rod, it's a nine and a half foot, six, seven. And to start with, always go for the heavier number. The reason for that is it'll load the rod easy, you'll feel it bend, and it'll make it casting a lot simpler. Let's put all this line back on the reel, and then show you the important end. I've shown you that the line tapers down gradually to the front end, and on that, what we've got is a braided loop. It's hollow, and it's held in place with this sleeve. And a little dab of super glue there and there, and it will never ever come off. On the front of this, there's the loop, and a lot of anglers, coarse anglers, will say, God, that's thick. But what happens is on the end of this, we put a tippet material. In the front of the bag here, I've got all my tippet material. When I go fishing, what I personally use is fluorocarbon. The reason for that is it's one and a half times heavier than nylon, so it'll cut through the water tension very, very easily. But when you're starting, what I advise is to get one of these. It's a tapered leader. The reason for that is, if you look at the line, the end of the line is quite thick. And what you want to do is transfer the power from the line gradually to the fly. And with the tapered leader, it's very, very thick at this end, but where you attach the fly, it becomes thinner. So we're going to get this tapered leader out now, and I'm going to show you a little trick. The problem with these, I'll just put the line on the bag there. The problem with these, is that the thick part is twisted around and we don't know how many times. So what you do is put your fingers through the loop there and then just gradually feed the thick part around in and out, in and out. And as soon as you've done it, as many times that it has been twisted around, what you'll feel is that the tension in these two fingers will actually be released. And as you can see, it all peels off nicely. It's not gonna get in a tangle all the way down to the front end. Before you're going to attach it to the leader loop, what we're going to do is just give it a little stretch. By pulling it through your hands, what it does, it generates a bit of heat and it irons out any kinks that you've got in that tapered leader. So just do it all the way through, right to the thick end there. So let's attach it to the braided loop. When I started fly fishing, the way I was taught was this. Feed it through there and then what you do with this tail is twisted around this part six times. So we'll do that now. There is one problem with this. Once you've twisted it around six times, you're then forever chasing this end and trying to get it back through the loop. So I'm gonna show you a little quick method that I have. First of all, feed it through that braided loop. Now, get hold of that end, get control of it in your fingers there. What we do then with the rest of the tapered loop is put it through those two fingers. So we create a U shape. Now pull some tension into that braided loop and you see that U turns into a V. And at this point, that's all we do is twist that braided loop around 
six or seven times and at this point take that finger keep the tension what that will do is keep that loop open then you feed it through there hold that end and then you start to pull and as you see the knots going down towards the braided loop just before it beds down put a bit of moisture in it so it goes down nicely and tight there then what you do snip off the excess and there you've got a nice neat knot on the braided loop and then on the business end that really really thin part what we do the same knot as that we would attach the fly In this, I'm going to show you the tips and techniques you need to tie your own flies. But why do we need to tie them? Because short-bought flies now are absolutely fantastic. Well, the reason for me is that I like to add my own character to each fly. If you look in this box, we've got a few olives, purple, pinks, oranges, all different colours. And on this side, we've got the coronamids, the dries and the shuttlecocks. And I've even got on this side of the box what I call eggs with legs we've got three legs in the front three in the back we've even actually got a gold head on the front you won't buy that in any shop and if i'm struggling i'll put that on the cast in front of me well this is my typical fly tying bench all a mess and i can never find anything but over here i've got marabou very mobile material when it's in the water view this this pink blow it but as you can see, very, very mobile. And we've got all different colours. We've got olives, blacks, greens. This is turkey feather dyed. That'll go on the tail and in the wing of a fly. Then for the body, we have different colour of what we call fritz. There's a pink one there, orange, olive, black. You name it, it comes in any colour. Then we have the booby eyes. This is what creates that buoyancy in the fly and attracts the fish to them. And lastly over here, I've got all sparkly tinsel. You can buy these in fishing tackle shops. Also going to haberdashery shops. You never know, you can pick up these odd things that will give you or give your fly the edge. Let's tidy this bench up and start tying. The biggest piece of equipment that you need is a fly tying vice. Now you can spend as much as you want. They can start from 20 pound all the way up to two, three, 400 pound. The most important thing with a vice is make sure that the jaw will hold that hook firmly. This one's great because it has two grooves. So the smaller hook goes in the front one and the bigger hook goes in the back one. So I'll put the hook in there. And the great thing, the hook will not damage the jaws. So you'll get a lot more life out of the jaws. The next thing we need is a bobbin holder. Now, when I started fly tying, what I used to do is get the silk and wrap it around the hook with my finger and thumb. The problem with that is it's not very accurate. With a bobbin holder, you see the top of that. Every turn you put on the hook, the silk goes exactly where you want it to go. Now to thread this through, can be a little bit difficult. First of all, cut the wastage off. You can buy a bobbin threader, which is a piece of wire that you put through there, it comes out and you put it through. But I don't use that. That's all I do is find the middle of the bobbin. And then once I fed it up so much, go to the other side, quick suck, and there it is, straight through. So there's your bobbin and your silk ready to go. The next thing are hackle pliers. This will help you put the hackle around the front of the fly. And I'll show you that a little bit later. This is probably one of the most important parts of fly tying. It's the scissors. Don't skimp on these. These can tidy any fly up. If there's little bits poking out here and there, a good pair of scissors will always help you out. Secondly, I've got another pair of scissors. The reason for that is that I can cut wire, I can cut tinsel without damaging my best pair of scissors. So how do we start fly tying? I've got to get this silk onto that hook. A lot of people will find it difficult. They'll try and wrap it round and it'll become loose and they can't get it tied on. First step, put it behind there 
just hold your finger and thumb which will keep the tension then what we must do is turn it over and when you do lock it in place lock it there and I'm using this bright colored thread so hopefully you can see it a lot better and what I want to do now is put a base layer of silk all the way down just before the bend of the hook and it has to be in touching turns and a little trick I was once taught was if I keep this end up every turn I do slides back down so making sure you don't have a gap at all so we'll just take it all the way down just keep on going keeping the tension with my right hand with that bobbin don't pull too tight otherwise you could snap the thread at this point now be very very careful because you're coming into the place where the hook is and if your thread catches the tip of that hook it can snap it so just angle it away as you come in you're pulling it away from that hook all the way down right near to the bend of the hook let's cut that off and start tying the fly first fly a very simple and basic one it is a peacock spider so we need a bit of peacock to go in the body I'll just pull a couple of fibers out and that comes out of a peacock's tail the thick end here is off the quill and you have the thinner end towards the top just a little tip just pull them and you see just those ends just snap off if you tied those ends in you started tying it around then halfway up the body you could snap off so you'd have to restart again so we're going to tie them in by just pushing them underneath there bringing the silk over and then just slowly locking them in place tidying the bits up all the way up the hook there we go nicely up to where I want the body to finish at this point you can either turn this around some people like to wrap it directly on I just want to twist them a little bit it'll make them a little bit stronger when you're wrapping these up now you have to let go at this point so just put your hand on top of the vise keep the tension underneath bring your finger and thumb back and when you're rolling it up just take them up in touching turns make sure there's no silk throwing showing through there we go all the way up take your time and please don't let go otherwise it'll all unravel and you have to start all over again and that's happened to me many many a time so just come all the way up that silk needs to be a little bit further towards the head there we go right up now to lock it off in place hold this in the right hand and then bring the silk on that bobbin around a couple of times there we go locked in place and then cut it off be careful don't cut the silk otherwise the whole fly will unravel so what I actually do I push the bobbin and the silk away from me so it keeps it away from the point of the scissors snap that off there we go now we're ready to put the hackle on what the hackle is are the fibers on the head you can either use a hen hackle this is a soft 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 hackle when you're fishing with them they will cloak the fly I actually want this fly to sit on the surface a little bit now I'm going to use a cock hackle and you will see that the fibers in this let's pull one of these out the fibers are very very stiff so it's going to prevent this fly sinking to measure this against the fly and the hook just bend it and as you see that looks a little bit too big so we'll just go a little bit further down there we go that's about the size I want so I'm going to tie it in there first of all just pull the fibers down and disregard that then we're going to tie this in put it in at an angle underneath the hook just hold it there and then tie in making sure it's tied in securely because there's nothing worse and starting to pull this hackle around the hook and it pulls out we'll just trim that end off Let's just move the vise around a little bit 
and with a sharp point scissors, it just tidies up. Now for the hackle pliers. This makes your job easy. Otherwise, you'd have to pull it around with your finger and thumb. What these do, just hook on there. And then, that's so all you do is take the hackle around the fly as many times as you want. I'm just going to do two or three turns. But every turn I do, I'm pulling the hackles back, then laying the next one in front, pulling them back, laying the next one in front. And then, to lock this in place, just take the silk through, slowly through all the hackle. There we go. Then, pull everything out of the way. A couple of turns in the head to start with. And then you can cut this off. Now, be careful. If you take the scissors in and cut underneath, you're going to cut all these fibers away as well. So, just make a V shape with the scissors. Pull the tension on the hackle, and then that will actually cut the hackle, the wasted stuff, but nothing underneath the fly. So we'll do a couple more turns with the silk now, and then we're going to finish it off. And to finish it off, you can either use a couple of half hitches. And a simple way to do that, you can either use an end of a biro, or on the end of my hackle pliers, there's a little hole, and I can just turn it around there, and just slip that on, there's one, there's two, but the better way and the more secure way is to make a whip finish. And what we do is put them over those two fingers and then make the number four with the thread. And then we're going to rotate my fingers around once, twice, three times, even go around four times, then hold the tension with the end of the hackle pliers, just pull it up, all the way up to the fly, and then there it goes, just secures on the head. And just to finish off then, we'll take good old varnish, and just put a dab on the silk, making sure it doesn't touch the hackles, otherwise that will make them solid. Good thing with this vise, I can rotate it underneath, and just cover that. And there you go, that's the peacock spider. This is a marrow spoon, and it's got a trough there, and it curves up at the end. And what you do is push this down into the fish's stomach, rotate it a few times to find out exactly what they've been feeding on. So we're going to put it in to the fish's mouth, and I put it in upside down, rotate it all the way around a couple of times, then pull it out slowly, and this one, <laughs> nothing for breakfast. No wonder he was so hungry to take my nymph. Over here on the plate, what I've actually done, I took my little bug net, ran around the side, in the weeds, got a few insects out to show you. First of all, we have what I call a coronamid or a buzzer. This is this little worm type insect there, and if I was gonna fish that and imitate it, I'll lie my imitation next to it, there is a buzzer. It's either called a super glue or an epoxy buzzer. Now, I'll just push that a little bit closer. But as you can see, this coronary is very, very lively. And that's the way they swim up to the surface. So when you're fishing the buzzers, a lot of anglers will fish them very, very slowly. Don't be scared to put a little bit of life into it. That might be the difference between catching a fish and not catching a fish. Next, we have a freshwater shrimp. There it is there. Now, if you're going to imitate this exactly, it would take you hours and hours on the vise. So what I actually use is a hair's ear. I'm just going to lay it down next to it. You'll see that the proportions are very, very similar. But with this one, again, it swims, it's lively. So again, put a little bit of life into the retrieve and you might be able to catch a few extra fish. So those are a few insects that we've seen that live in the lake. Let's put one of those flies on go in the water and catch another fish. Second fish of the day, again, a cracking little rainbow of about a pound and three quarters. Let's get him in the net. Wet your hands. Oh, the flies just popped out nicely. This one's still lively. 
Let's have a look at it. There you go, pound and a half, pound and three quarters, cracking, fully finned rainbow. Let's put him back. Make sure he gets his breath back. He's nearly ready. Well, I'm not going to take the fish out of the net. I'm just going to support the fish. He's ready to swim out. Tilt the edge. Just let him. No, don't swim into the net. Come on. He's going to swim out. There you go. Brilliant. Now let's go and have a look at some casting. First of all, what I'm going to do, I've taken the fly off, put everything back on the reel, because I'm going to show you a little trick. When people start to thread the line up the rings, they tend to use the end of the leader, which is very narrow, and sometimes you can miss a ring, but when you're feeding it up, the worst thing that can happen, when you put the reel on the grass, it might snag in it, and then you've lost everything, and what happens, it unthreads itself, and you have to start all over again. To prevent that, a simple trick to do is to get the line, fold it in half. This makes it easier to thread through the ring like that. Also, once you put that rod on the grass behind you, if at any time that stops, if it's a tangle on the reel or if it's a snag in the grass, what happens is that loop, when it comes down to the ring, that loop becomes bigger and it prevents it unthreading itself. So we'll put this all the way up the rod making sure that you don't miss a ring. There's nothing worse than filling it all up, getting ready to fish, putting your flies on, and then suddenly you found out that you've missed a ring. It'll prevent you having to start all over again. Get the cast out, and then instead of the fly, which I did put on a little bit earlier, what we're gonna do is put a little piece of wool on to prevent the line cracking. So just get a little bit of wool. It doesn't have to be too much. And then the knot I showed you earlier, that is the blood knot, same thing, fold the wool over, get that wool in that hand, create that V and U shape, just spin it around six or seven times, feed it back in through that bottom hole and tighten. To get all this line out, a lot of people find it difficult because when you have let's say three or four feet of line outside the tip, there's not a lot of weight to take everything out. So what I do, simple trick, is put it on the water and use the surface tension in that water to actually draw my line up the rings. Just shake it back and forth until you get eight to 10 yards of line on the water. There we go, that's enough. Now at this point, what we're gonna do is show you a roll cast. I call this my get out of jail cast. If anything goes wrong, and I'll show you a little bit later, this is the cast to sort it out. What we do is we bring it back there, wait for a second, and at this point, what we're doing is waiting for the line to settle behind the rod tip. We're creating the letter D. Then that's all we do is tap it forward. So we'll do that again, come back, wait for the letter D, tap it forward, and the line shoots out. Then you're ready to cast. So how do we cast? First of all, let's look down there. Look at the stance. A lot of people will say, when you start in fly casting, if you're gonna start casting with your right hand, you should put your right foot forward. This is what we call a closed stance. The reason for that is that when you're standing like this, you close the body off to the casting arm. This is very, very good. If you're fishing dry fly, if you're fishing on a river or any lake, if you want the fly to go in a certain place, everything is in a straight line. So where you look, that fly will be delivered. However, the most common one we see is the open stance. That means your left foot forward. The reason it's called an open stance is that you open your body out to the casting arm. It enables you to move the rod in a wider arc all the way back there, right through there. It enables you to generate more tip speed, which results in longer casting. When you're starting though, just stand feet shoulder width apart. Be comfortable. The next thing is, where do we put the arm when we cast? A lot of people, and I see a lot of anglers when they're fishing, their arm gets up here, they're waving it around like that. Now what you want to do when you're casting with your arm position, put yourself in as strong a position as possible. Simple. Drop the arm by the side, bend at the elbow, then introduce the rod. And if you think about it, when you keep your hand and your arm close to your body, you're very, very strong. When you take it further away up there, you're becoming very, very weak. 
If you ever see a boxer throwing a knockout punch on the telly, or if you've been to a boxing match, it always comes from the body. Same thing with this. Keep that hand very, very close. The next thing is the grip. Now, this is a personal thing. And if you went round all the anglers, there'd be a slight variation. You can start off with the thumb pointing up the back of the rod. I tend to start like that, and a lot of, of beginners will do. But some people find it a little bit more comfortable with their thumb going up the side of the rod. Some anglers then actually have their finger going up the side of the rod, and others even have their index finger pointing directly up the back of the rod. The most important thing is be comfortable. There isn't a correct and an incorrect grip. It's what suits you. Remember, if you're comfortable here, everything else is comfortable. The casting will be relaxed. So we're gonna roll this out now again, this get out of jail cast. Tap it out there. Now we're getting ready for the overhead cast. First of all, start with a rod tip right down on the water. And what you must think of the overhead cast, the back cast is accelerating to the vertical. So we start off slowly, speed up, stop and push forward. Now the lift off is the most important part in the cast. When people start fly casting, they're very scared of all the line in front of them. And it's sitting on the water and they know they have to lift it off and throw it up in the air behind them. So what they tend to do is start off too quickly. And what you see is this big snatch off the water. Now what that does, it actually scares all the fish away. That big snatch, big disturbance, all the fish are swimming away that way, that way, and that way. Basically, anywhere but where you're fishing. The next thing that happens, when you snatch that off the water, it overloads this rod, puts too much bend in it. And the last thing, it actually overloads your arm. You're making it hard work. A good description I once heard was, peel the line off the water. So what I'm gonna do, you peel most of the line off the water, then you kick it back. Now, once you've kicked it back up in the air behind you, you have to wait for the line to be straight up in the air before you come forward. Now we've got a problem. How long do you wait? Unfortunately, there isn't a count method. You can't go one, two, and then come forward because it's dependent on how much line you have outside the tip. What people say is, feel for the line turning over. The problem with that is, when you're starting fly fishing, you don't know what to feel for. Some people will say, have a look at it. Now, at this point, if I'm standing with a square stance, if I turn my head to have a look, watch what happens to the top half of the body. When I start to lift the rod up, and then my head starts to turn, you notice the shoulder starts to turn. If that shoulder turns, the arm turns. If that arm turns, the rod's going to turn. And worst of all, what's going to happen is, as you see, the fly line goes behind me. Now, maybe the fly line behind your head is not much of a problem, but at the end of the fly line, what do you have? Well, you've got the tippet material, but at the end of that, what do you have? Well, it's that fly. Inside that fly is a sharp hook, and that is very, very dangerous if it's behind your head. So I'm going to show you now what you can do if you cannot get the timing of waiting for that line to straighten behind you. What we do is we leave the rod and arm in one position. We then turn sideways, so basically parallel to where the rod and arm is. So then I can turn there, I can turn there, but notice that this didn't move. So it's up there, yes, the line straightened, then I come forward. Kick it up, watch the line, it's straightened, then push forward. If you do that a few times, you'll get the right timing. Now the last part, the forward cast. The forward cast, very simple, easiest explanation I'll give you, it's hitting a nail with a hammer. Position of the nail depends on the wind. At the moment, imagine, the wind is coming across a little bit at the moment, but imagine that the wind is coming behind me. So what I would do in the distance on the far bank, I'd put an imaginary nail basically parallel to the water. And what I would do is this, you just tap the nail early and then let the whole thing float down to the water, the fly lands gently and it lands ready to catch a fish. The problem is when we're fishing, it's not always like that. We could have a right hand wind, we could have a left hand wind or the worst one the wind that comes into your face. In that situation, a lot of fishermen will actually do this. They will push harder, thinking the harder they push, the more chance that line's gonna cut through it. Actually, it's incorrect, because the harder you push, the bigger the front part of the line, the bigger the loop becomes. The bigger that is, the more chance the wind's gonna blow it back in a horrible mess in front of you. So, when you're casting into the wind, the trick is this. Now, I'm gonna 
cast that back, leave it on the grass behind me. What you actually do, you bring the hand further forward and then you tap the nail late in the cast. And what you're doing, you're aiming at that imaginary nail about two to three yards further than you're casting. So we lift off slowly, accelerate, stop, wait for the line to straighten, then we push forward. That's how simple the overhead cast is. Now let's go to the next step. To get more distance, what you have to do is bend this spring a little bit more. Step one, we can push a bit harder with the rod hand. If you push that little bit harder, the rod will flex more, the line will travel faster in the air, and you'll cast that little bit further. But be careful. If you push too hard with the rod hand, what you'll find is that the loop will close up in front of you. Now, if you watch the loop in the air, it is like an elongated U shape, which is perfect because the fly is traveling above the belly of the line. It'll turn over and there won't be a problem. However, if you push that bit too much with this rod hand, what will happen? That loop will close up. It becomes a circle. If you watch that again, there's your U shape. This time, push too hard. There's that circle. The problem with that is the fly is underneath the line. If the fly is underneath the line, it has to climb over the line to get out on the water. The problem with that is that it might hook into your line. That's great. Why? Because if it hooks into your line, you know about it because the fly will be there. If it travels all the way down, it might hook into your braided loop. That's great as well because you also know about it. However, if it transfers into this leader, what it will do, it'll make a knot. It's called an excessive power knot, but more commonly anglers call it wind knots. Now this is eight pound fluorocarbon. You'll see it's very, very strong, but as soon as you introduce a knot into it, what happens, this eight pound fluorocarbon becomes the stre same strength as probably four pound. And you will see, I've put a knot in there now, just wrap it around my fingers and it'll snap very, very easily. The problem with that is you don't know about that knot. That is out there, there's a fly on it, you're pulling it back in, the fish takes you, you lift off, you lose the fish, you lose the fly, and you think, oh, lost it. Well, what happens when you pull it back, there'll be a little kink at the end of the fluorocarbon. That's the telltale sign that there was a knot. So how can we actually get more bend in this rod to cast further? Simple and easy. At the moment, this left hand, that's all it's been doing is retrieving the line when you're fishing. Now we're going to introduce the left hand into the cast. As the rod is actually loading on the back cast, with the left hand you're actually going to pull down. What that does, it pulls more bend in the rod. That makes the line travel faster in the air behind you. What that does, because the line is traveling faster that way, it actually puts a bit more bend in this spring before you start pushing. If you have more bend in this spring, then you push, obviously there'll be more bend, there'll be more line speed, and you're gonna cast those few extra yards. There are a couple of problems though. I see some people, when they draw their left hand down there, the problem is this left hand seems a little bit lonely down here and it wants to come and meet its partner up here. And instead of staying down there, when they're coming forward, they bring their hands together. When you do that, that amount of line from this hand, from my left hand to my right hand, is allowed to slide through that spring. At that point, the tension is lost. Everything catches up there, and then it lands in a horrible mess in front of you. So remember, with the left hand, when you pull down, you must stay down, push forward, and let go from down there. The other one some anglers do is this. They're very scared that the line's not gonna run through this bottom ring, and they try to help it. What they do is this. On the back cast, they pull down, they stay down. When they come forward, they try and push the line through the rings. Don't do that. Have the confidence. The line is designed to shoot. It will take itself out. So pull down, stay down, push forward, and let go. Do that once again. Left hand, they both start lifting it together. Pull down, stay down, push forward, and let go. And that will add two to three, even five yards to your cast. next fly I'm going to tie is the cat's whisker. Um, I have no idea why it's called the cat's whisker. It could be because it catches so many fish. It could be the cat's whiskers. 
Now this is basically a lure. It's there to get an aggressive response from the fish. It can even be turned into a booby where you put ether foam on the head of the fly that will make it buoyant. I'm not going to do that at the start. I'm using red silk as well. There is the reason for that and I'll explain at the end. Now to start with, we're going to put a tail in. And I want quite a long tail. So this will actually swim nicely behind the hook. This is marabou. And just get a good old chunk off. And just roll it around in your fingers. And that's what will make the tail. But I'm just going to cut off a little bit first. And then just strip the fibers off. Let's put it up here. Strip it off. It'll be easier to tie onto the hook. Right. Put that there. To tie the tail in, don't try and keep tension in the silk around. What will happen is the whole thing will go around the shaft of the hook. What we're going to do, just get that little bit of red silk out of the way. Cut that off. Right. We put it in position. First of all, check the length of the tail that I want. That looks all right. Put my finger and thumb at the back end of the hook. And then take the bobbin holder and push the silk up and trap it between your finger and thumb. Then go underneath the hook with the bobbin and pull down. Do that a couple of times. Always pulling down underneath the hook. And then just come up a little bit, tidy that off. And that will make sure that the tail lies flat on top. Then to make the body, it's yellow. And what I've got is very, very thin chenille. I'll cut that off. And then you're going to attach that to the hook. Problem is that piece is quite thick. So if you take your finger and thumbnail and just pull a little bit of that green off, it's far, far easier to tie in. Put it in underneath at an angle and then just trap it with that silk and then make sure you trap it in nicely all the way up and then on the way up as you're taking the silk towards the eye just tidy all the fly up all those little marabou feathers that are sticking out right up to where you want to put the wing on the fly and with this i'm going to just turn it around the hook Touching turns, no gaps, so you don't see the silk at all. And you'll notice I'm using red silk. Some anglers will use white silk, some anglers will use black. I like red. The reason for it, it's my personal preference. It's me adding something to this fly. It's a hot spot, a trigger point just at the end of the fly. Now, just to trap that in place, hold that chenille, take the silk around three or four times and then cut this off, making sure you avoid the silk. Let's get that scissors, the sharp one. There we go, that's out of the way. Then I'm gonna put a wing on this, just get a nice base of silk to start with. Same feather, marabou, dyed white. Pull a nice section, that looks all right. And then just rip it off the plume and then roll it in your fingers. That looks nice. Cut the end off. Sometimes when you're tying flies, right, the phone might go or something might happen. Somebody might come to the door. You don't want to leave this hanging about. Well, you actually can. If you twist that around your finger, that will stay in place. You can leave, and leave it on the vice or leave it on the table there. Go and answer the door, have a cup of tea, come back and that will still be ready to tie on to the hook. Just before you're going to do it, just rip some of those fibers away so it won't be very bulky on the head. Oh, that's it. That's about right. And then tie that on. And again, same as we did with the uh, tail, up there, and then pull directly underneath the hook. Same thing again. Just a couple more turns to lock in place. You'll see now that you've got all the fibers sticking over the eye. This is where a good pair of scissors comes into their own. We just lay it flat on the eye, just start cutting, making sure that you get all the fibers sticking forward, get them out of the way. We'll 
rotate that round. Make sure you don't cut the silk. Nothing worse than just about to finish the fly and the whole silk comes off and the wing falls off. And just to finish off, I'm going to put a nice red head. And that's the reason it's a hot spot, trigger point for the fish. I think it catches me those extra few fish rather than a black head or a white head. It just stands out in the water. And to finish off with, whip finish, wrap it around those fingers and then keep the tension in the bobbin, turn it around three or four times. There we go, that's enough. Just to bring this up, watch it with your scissors. Mine has one side serrated, one smooth, so put it down there to keep the tension on the smooth side. Pull it all the way up there. And it cuts off, and just to finish off, got a bit of, bit of varnish. What that will do, it'll secure it in place. Also, it'll make that red head, that hot spot, really, really stand out in the water act as that trigger point for the fish. And there we go, the good old cat's whiskers. Hunting around the vegetation on the lake. And I've got a few insects to show you. First of all, in this plate down here, I've got what I call a baby bloodworm. It's quite red, and I'll just give it a little poke, and it's not really moving too much. And to imitate that, virtually impossible because it's very very small but a bloodworm imitation they come in all sizes there's one and that's quite a chunky one and as you can see it's got a bead on the front of it that would sink down very very fast but for the bigger imitation what I've got is this bloodworm and as you can see it's got marabou tail and on the head and when that's pulled through it will imitate the bloodworm pulsing towards the surface of the water then, over here, we've got a couple of olive nymphs. Now, I'm just going to try and get hold of one of these. And they're very, very fast. There we go. It's sat on the forceps nicely. I'll just leave it. There it is. And to imitate that, you don't have to tie a perfect nymph. Just a suggestion. Same colour. What I've got is a gold head olive. There it is. And again, the gold head will take it down. And when you're pulling it back with a floating line, it'll come up towards the surface and then drop down. And that tail will pulse very, very similar to the natural olive when it's swimming through the water. And if it's a little bit darker, I've got here a nymph with no gold head. And that will just slowly sink down. And again, short, sharp tweaks just to imitate the natural swimming through. But lastly, we've got over here, we've got the fry, baby fish. And as you can see underneath, there's like a little air sac. We call them jelly fry, and they're very, very difficult to imitate. I've got a pheasant tail nymph, and as you can see, in the thorax there is that silver, which imitates the bubble. And if you use these flies, then hopefully you'll catch a lot more fish. As you're fishing the lure back in, just change the speed all the time but the most important thing you must give the fish every opportunity to actually take the fly unfortunately a lot of anglers what they'll do is when they've got the rod length of line out in front of them they'll actually start lifting them up here into the roll cast position the problem is at this point if a fish was to take that fly you'd have to actually lift like that when you lift like that, what happens is you pull the fly out of the water. So what I'm going to do, cast this out again. Same retrieve, just keep varying it all the time. Let the fly sink, first of all. What I'm doing when I'm watching the fly sink, I'm just watching the leader, the fluorocarbon leader, cutting through the surface tension. When all that cuts, I'll start retrieving. And then it can be a slow figure of eight. It can be short, sharp pulls. It can be stop. When you stop, watch the end of the line. If that does anything untoward, then you have to lift into it. Now, the important part, when you're starting to come closer into the bank, start to rotate your body. At this point, what you're doing is you're bringing the rod sideways onto you. What that will do is bring the fly closer 
And once you've got the rod length of line out, don't think about recasting. What we do is we actually bring in the rod further up, further up. And this platform is fantastic to do it because I can al always go as far up as the bank. At this point now, if a fish was to take that fly, I can actually pull sideways. That means it'll set the hook in the fish's mouth. If it doesn't, the fly is still in the water. It gives it a last chance. Even when it's coming opposite me there, that fish could be concentrating on that fly. It could take directly on my feet. Once you've seen the fly, you can't see a fish following it. Roll it back out, lift off, and then recast. We've started on the left here. We've still got a bit of weed out. What I'm doing, using the countdown method, counting at 10 seconds before I start retrieving. That fly is starting to sink. It's gone all the way down. Then just slowly and slowly bringing it back every once in a while, giving that faster tweak to rotate that fly a little bit faster. Here we go. Yes. I saw a few natural damselflies coming off and it proves to be the right choice of fly. When you're fighting the fish, you be in control of it at all times. Keep that rod 45 degrees there, you direct him where you want him. Now with this net, I've actually got a long handled net. The worst time when you're netting a fish is when it comes close to the jetty. It sees either my face or it sees the jetty and it thinks, oh, I'm going to get caught and he makes a last bid for freedom. That's when most fish are actually caught with an extra long handle net, just put my foot on it, to extend it. What that does, it can net the fish further out, further away, so it doesn't feel as much under threat. So get down. Now, once you've got that fish to the surface, try and turn his head. Ooh, this one's got a bit of a fight in him. Come on. He's trying to push down into the weeds. Here we go, there's his head on the surface. Keep it up, keep it up, and just skate it into the net. A beautiful rainbow. Oh, this is a bigger one. And there we go, a beautiful, fully finned rainbow of just over two pounds. And as you can see in its mouth, right in the scissors, there's that hotspot damsel. He wasn't gonna get away. the dry fly out at the moment it's very very good because the wind's coming directly into my face and that will introduce that little bit of slack into the line allowing the flies to drift naturally back towards me one thing always keep your eye on the fly at all times as soon as if I turn to you there I guarantee you the fish will take me they have this sixth sense that they know that you're not watching and as the wind's bringing the line towards you, just allow a few S's to go into the line, but no more. Just, and as it's coming, just keep a direct contact. Ooh, there's a fish just coming on the left. Hopefully, yeah, there he is. Head and tail over that shuttlecock that I've got on the point. He was coming from the right to the left, and that was just in front of him. There's a nice little fish. Took that shuttlecock on the point, size 12, quite small. He was just sitting in the surface film. He's not quite ready to come in yet. Come on. He's trying to bury himself in the weeds in front of me, but keep him under control. I'm trying to bring him this way, just by pulling the rod that way, and he's kicking into the weeds. Just keep him away. And once you get him to the surface, be careful, because when he sees this platform, that's when he's gonna go his last fight for freedom he's now got he's trying to get under the platform push him out a little bit right there he is on the surface let's keep his head up get him into the net a fish let's have a look around a pound and a half to pound and three quarters and in the corner of the mouth that shuttlecock i can't think of a better way to catch fish than with a dry fly Unfortunately, we've been beaten by good old father time. 
I've had a great day. I've got a few fish for supper. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've learned a few new methods as well. Next time you go fishing, you may be able to catch a few more fish. I'll see you again. Tight lines.